Okay. Every year people ask me what they should get their swimmer for Christmas. And I always tell them the same thing. Get a pair of drag socks made by Aquavolo. It's the perfect stocking stuffer for any swimmer. Honestly, there's no simpler training tool to build power in the water than a pair of drag socks. Go to aquavolo.com and use the code Brett, B-R-E-T-T, at checkout and save 10%. The offer's good only through November, so order now. Okay, George Bavel, welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm doing well, Brett. Thanks for having me. Uh, this is a, a great honor. Um, I have, I, I, this is what I do generally with my podcast is um, I, I spend a couple of hours with the person before I get online. And um, I've done that with you today, just looking at photographs and, and reading uh, stories about you and, and reading your bio. And uh, Honestly, George, you are a fascinating man. You've had an incredible life, really, uh, to this point. You've had an incredible life. Well, thank you, Brett. It's an honor to be on your podcast. I'm a big fan. I've watched a lot of the episodes, and I think you do a wonderful job of touching on many pertinent topics. And, uh, yeah, interesting lives can be hard lives, but um, we grow a lot from them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I do... We have spoken about this off camera, but I do want to um, address kind of an elephant in the room that you and I have not been on the best of terms um, over the past uh, number of years. I did coach you at one stage and we can kind of go into that a little bit in terms of wh when I coached, I think it was around 2009. Um, and, and you and I had an, an incident on the pool deck that I um, deeply regret as a coach and, and learn from. And, and I know that um, it affected you in a, in a way that ha put a big strain on our relationship. And I, I did want people who know us personally to know that um, I've been very thankful for you to grant me forgiveness for, for um, the incident that happened and also um, move past it together as, and, and being able to now celebrate each other in the way that, uh, you know, I have respect for you and you have respect for me. So I, I just wanted to thank you for that. Oh, well, thank you. Um, there's nothing to mention, really. Um, very grateful for everything you did for me. You coached me for a while and I had an opportunity to work with you and some of the best sprinters. And that incident, it was a learning experience for me. We're both on journeys. We're both learnings, learning. And um, I hold no grudges, no hard feelings. Oh, I appreciate that. Well, th that means a lot to me. So thank you very much. So uh, in terms of your career itself, it, it, like I said, it's fascinating. You're a five-time Olympian from Trinidad and Tobago. For, for those people who don't, don't know exactly where Trinidad is, just, just tell us where the country itself is. And that is the most southerly Caribbean island. And um, people tend to think of the Caribbean and they think, oh, are you by Bahamas? No, we're like 2,000 miles further south east of South America, east of Venezuela. So how on earth did you become this superstar swimmer from, from this very small island in the Caribbean? I don't know if I ever became a superstar swimmer, but um, how did it begin or how did it? Yeah, you know, how did it begin for you? I think um, it was the ocean that really got me into swimming, really. Um, our family of holidays, we would spend on, um, on the water, on the ocean, on boat trips. And I, uh, I heard that I learned to swim before I could walk. And then my grandmother had a pool and um, in the afternoons after a nap, we would go over there and I'd, I'd swim. And um, 
actually my first love I think was swimming below the water, just diving and like swimming around down at the bottom of the pool and the bottom of the ocean. And ever since I can remember, I've always had a good relationship with the water. And um, my father was a decent swimmer. I think he won the Central American and Caribbean games. Now my mother was athletic, she ran in the Olympics. And when I was, um, I think maybe about six or so, uh, I started to swim at a club. Seven, I started to go to races and uh, took it from there. Wow, and so was, uh... Were there swim clubs? I mean, what was the swimming like in Trinidad? It's um, if you're coming from the US or the UK or Germany or Canada, it's very hard for you to imagine what swimming in Trinidad would have been like. Um, back then, it was very third world. Unfortunately, our facilities were really poor, and I constantly suffered from air infections, rashes. There were years where they would never be able to get the pH of the swimming pool right. So you'd come out of practice and your teeth would hurt even if you just breathed on them too hard. You couldn't eat any crunchy food. Um, and then the, the coaching, the, the swimming community was very small. Um, back then before the internet, there were various cassette tapes that were shared around, you know, like one household would borrow it, then another one would family would borrow it and watch it. And I remember watching um, a pop of VHS tape over and over again and uh, tried to emulate his style. But it was really small and um, very humble beginnings, honestly. It's amazing that I got where I got because coming from Trinidad and swimming, you have nobody to aspire to be like. There was nobody who'd ever done anything great in the sport before. So it's very hard for people that come from those type of backgrounds to conceptualize that it is even possible to be great, which is a, it, it's a hindrance in one regard, but in another way, you start off swimming out of the pure love for the mm. sport without any ideals, any grand plans. You're just doing it because you like it and it's fun to do. When was your first Olympic experience in terms of sitting at home watching the Olympics? I think it was 96. I saw some of the races of the 96 Olympics. Yeah. Mm, wow. Was there any, any particular races that stood out for you at that point in time? Um, I remember watching Pankratov swim a 200 butterfly or 100 butterfly with incredible underwaters. And that mm. was something I just hadn't seen before. I hadn't seen before. Um, of course, there were the stars, um, the Cuban swimmers that stood out. Um, Rodolfo Falcon and Nisa Bent going one, two in the hundred backstroke. That was a big deal. And then, um, then of course the rivalry between Alex Popov and Gary Hall was quite something. I remember that distinctly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I released a podcast today on that. So, uh, it was very timely, but, uh, how then do you get from sitting at home and watching the 96 Olympics, to becoming an Olympian yourself in 2000? What, what, was it, what happened in those four years? Well, the whole journey was all about really learning, learning how to swim. And back then in Trinidad, we never specialized. Everybody swam every event, at every meet. Mm. I was trying to be good at freestyle. I was trying to be good at backstroke, good at breaststroke, good at butterfly, good at the distance events and good at the sprint events. And it all kind of came together, this all around trying to be the best swimmer I can possibly be, learning and practicing and constantly testing myself. And that led to sort of um, the 200 IM came out of that, you know, 200 freestyle, 200 IM. And um, I qualified for the Sydney Olympics in the 200 meters individual medley. And at the Olympics, I think uh, I qualified in many events. I ended up swimming the 100 freestyle, the 400 IM, the 200 IM, <laughs> totally, totally different races, 400 IM and 100 free at the same games. How old were you there? I had just turned 17. And, and all your qualification was done in Trinidad? Um, I think I had uh, started to compete internationally in 1999 at the Pan American Games mm. and I also the Canadian Nationals. And I had attained um, qualification standards in the course of the year, building up to the Olympics over and over again, repeatedly. Now, who's coaching you at this stage? Um, well, um, a man by the name of Edward Tuberoso. I'm very grateful to him. Um, 
He was really uh, passionate about technique and he instilled in this small group of us uh, an incredible work ethic. And he made us take a lot of pride in the toughness and the sweet struggle and he glorified distance swimming. So I was training for the 1500 freestyle. And when I was 15, I was like 15, 55 in the 1500 um, short course meters. Um, some of my toughest rivalries were in these distance events when I was growing up. Wow, wow. Hmm. Uh, Edward Tuberoso, yeah. Another coach before that by the name of Hayden Nawalo. Then later on, I worked with um, Anil Roberts. Mm -hmm. Many people have contributed to my journey and my uh, success. I can't claim it as myself, my own. Well, that's, that's it's kind of the way it is with uh, all successful careers. There's many people that have helped along the way, right? And I'm sure you're no different. But so you have this oh, Olympic experience in 2000. Um, what was that like in terms of being at the Olympic Games and competing, uh, in, not just in the races itself, but being part of the Games? It was surreal. Um... It was hard to imagine something on that scale before going to it. Um, the level of competition. And of course, this, I had some experiences there that sort of um, were confusing almost. You know, I had to, I was in the 100 freestyle. So I'm, I'm watching Eric the Eel from the ready room. <laughs> so we're seeing Eric the Eel swimming and almost drowning. And we're seeing like the likes of Popov and Klim getting ready to go out. Um, it was... Um, you know, I think I won my 200 iron heat and I just missed the semifinal. It was a breakout meet for me in a way to learn to, to handle that type of high pressure environment because, you know, you never get an opportunity to swim in front of that many people in a swimming stadium. So that was my first big exposure. Were you there, was were you there by yourself? Yes. Um, there was an oldest from Trinidad, um, a couple of years older than me, who sort of took me under his wing. Okay. Um, Sebastian Paddington. Um, mm -hmm. So there was really two of us, yeah, mm -hmm. two Trinidadian okay. swimmers there. Nice, uh, great. Well, you have a, you have a fantastic experience first time round. How then do you end up at Auburn University? Well, the the following year, um, I kept working on my two hundred IM and two hundred freestyle, and um, I went to the World Championships in Fukuoka. And of course, back then, you know, my family would buy the ticket at the competition. I'd have to buy an arena suit, real third world. You have no idea. <laughs> and at the Fukuoka 2001 World Championships, I had had this um, incredible record of being undefeated in the 200 IM for years, years. And um, like in a head-to-head -head race, undefeated. Years, I can't remember how many years now, three or four, or something ridiculous. And I'm going into the heats and I'm in the same heat with Massey Rosalino, the Olympic champion. And I'm afraid, oh my gosh, you know, my perfect record. Is it going to, to last through this heat? And I won the heat. I beat the Olympic champion. Wow. I made it to the semifinals. Then um, I think I beat him again in the semifinals and made it to the finals. And in the finals, um, you know, when you're young, you're coming out real aggressive. Um, I swam with a lot of emotion and not very tactful. And I went out really fast under the old world record. And I remember coming out into the breaststroke pullout, watching guys in the finals coming in backstroke. And my breaststroke was my weakest event back then. And um, most of the field passed me. It was probably last at this 150. And then swam back on everybody to come fourth in the finals. And I think that opened the eyes of um, some coaches in America and I started to be recruited heavily. And see, that's see just right it. there. That's, that's fascinating. You gave me chills just thinking about this kid from Trinidad doing what you just did to the, to the rest of the world. This is incredible. I mean, uh, I was in yeah. Fukuoka competing too. Uh, uh, I didn't have that effect on, on the world stage at that point in time, but my God, what a, what an impressive swim. So then you start talking to a few schools and I guess Auburn was, was one of, was David Marsh the first one to reach out or somebody else? A few recruited me. I had been uh, training uh, that year at Bulls back when Bulls was notorious for very, um, very long distance and difficult training. Mm. They had the philosophy back then. It's sort of like if you throw enough mud against the wall, some is going to stick. Mm -hmm. Most will break and some will carry on. And there were some weeks, I think I did more than um, 100K a week. 
um, it was a great environment to be in. I was really working hard and getting tougher and tougher by the day. And different universities started to notice me. I was a Florida State champion. And I got recruited um, by JT, uh, the coach of Tennessee came to visit me. Um, David Marsh came to visit me. I was also recruited by um, Stanford and USC. And of all the, the schools, I chose Auburn. You know, um, I really liked David Marsh, what he was, um, his ideas that he was proposing and the team dynamic there. And this is before, um, this is after you guys had won your national championships and then there was a sort of lull. Mm -hmm. This was before we started to win again. Wow. So I went to Auburn and, um, oh yes, uh, before I went to Auburn, my senior year of high school, after the world champs, I tried to lift a heavy suitcase with one arm. Sometimes you think you're stronger than you are. And it was too heavy for me and I tore where the muscles in my forearm attached to my humerus. So I had to take that whole um, summer off. This was right after the world short course championships where I was in the finals again. Um, and I really... Um, didn't swim much at all. I just did some free diving that summer. So I came to Auburn really raw and out of shape and injured. And I had to nurse this injury throughout the fall and get back into shape. So it was a big challenge for me. Wow. Wow. Well, I don't want to gloss over a career in any way, but let's just talk about your four years at Auburn. Never lose a dual meet. Never lose an SEC championship. Never lose an NCAA championship. I mean, it is the most incredible record in college swimming history. You never lost a meet, your, your, your senior class. Tell me who was in your senior class. I think, um, I don't know how true this is today, but I remember them saying that it was the first class in the history of all NCAA sports to finish without ever losing. And that would have been um, some very heroic characters like Eric Chanteau, mm. um, Doug Van Wee. Mm. And uh, Doug was a great all-around swimmer and very hardworking. You could count on him, very reliable. And also an, another man by the name of Kurt Cady. And now uh, this perfect record, there were times where it was really tested. One um, thing comes to mind where we were at a dual meet against Florida our senior year. And Florida had rested for this meet. And they were just whomping on us by the halfway point. And it came down to two things that had to happen. Eric Chanteau had to beat Ryan Lochte in the 400 IM. And our relays, we had to go one, two in the relays. So um, Eric, I pulled it out and he beat, Chan he beat uh, Ryan Lochte. So we were still in contention. That was very heroic of him. So I think he saved the perfect record there by himself. <laughs> and um, then in the relay, we had to go one, two against Florida. So we split our A relay and we put two fast guys and two slow guys on each of the A and B relays. And I had to be last on the, the slower of the two relays. Unfortunately, it didn't come down to me. We had locked the relay. We had uh, put it away by that point. But um, that's an example of how when you have such a perfect streak, a winning streak, it carries a lot of pressure to maintain it. Mm. And the more pressure there is, the more you're either going to find a way to make it happen or, or the pressure is going to break you. Wow. Just fascinating. There, there are so many questions that I have in regards to this uh, record. Uh, but in terms of the mentality, I mean, obviously, at some point, your senior class makes a decision that you want to continue winning, obviously. Uh, when, do you, when do you feel like, was there ever a sit down with the class itself where you, where you were like, okay, we're not losing, we, we want to keep this thing going? Was there any moment like that? No, uh, no, no singular moments. Back then, we, at Auburn, we had a team culture that just um, celebrated excellence and refuse to accept mediocrity and everything. And as an upperclassman, you had to call out, you know, the younger guys, if they weren't um, stepping up and really hold them accountable. And um, it, was a, it was an intense experience swimming in that team at that time. We were very focused and um, in some ways fanatical. But the thing is when you're a fanatic, like my whole swimming career, I was a fanatic. When you're a fanatic, you never know you're a fanatic because you end up being surrounded by other fanatics. True, 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 true. So who, who were the fanatics that had an influence on George Bavel's mentality and career maybe early on? Early on, um, I think it is kind of my nature. If I'm into something, I'm all the way into it. And um, 
if I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. I think I might have been one of the people who, who was kind of um, fueling this dynamic. For sure, yeah. Encouraged by the coaches. David Marsh is a champion coach. David wants to win. Some of his strategies for dual meets were just brilliant. Um, and the way he coached us. He's a, he's a great coach. I owe him a lot. Dave Durden uh, was the assistant coach. Mm -hmm. went on to be a very celebrated and acclaimed coach of the NCA as well, mm -hmm. winning many championships at Cal. So it was an all-around great team. Um, then you had Ralph Crocker as well uh, at the yeah, time, who was... Uh, mm -hmm. I really, really liked Ralph. He was a great man. Yeah, part of that mentality as well. Um, was there any one particular, uh, Eric Chanteau you mentioned, who is uh, one of the toughest people on earth as well, but is there any uh, other people like that that maybe had an influence during that time? Doug Van Wee doesn't get enough credits. Doug was a great swimmer. And um, unfortunately, he he never made the Olympic team. Um, you know, life happens to us and uh, you have to juggle a lot of things. But he was a great contributor as well. Fred Bousquet was a, a big standout Um there were Mark Gangelov as well, was a very mm -hmm. heroic um, contributor to our cause when he was on the team. These guys were older than me. Um, it was just a great environment. I felt very blessed to be around such motivated and um, passionate swimmers chasing after excellence every day. Do you think something like this is possible now? Could, could a team do what you did? Could they replicate that? Or is this, is this one, a, a once in a lifetime type thing? I think it is possible, but um, you have to create the culture from the ground up, I think. Mm -hmm. It has to the, the sort of cultivate this ethos, this, um, because there, there are some cultures that are very healthy and some cultures that are sick. And we, when we are sick, we think in sick ways and we want what's bad for us, which makes us more sick. And we see this, you know, a couple of teams will have a couple of guys who might be into some some very negative influences that are, are celebrated by the culture as cool. Maybe it's too much drinking or maybe something else or staying up late and partying. And if you want to have a really successful team, you have to have uh, a fully committed approach. Otherwise, you're just wasting your time. And I think we did have that at Auburn. It's pretty incredible to have that culture for four years, right? Yeah culture very healthy focused people who want what's good for them and are willing to work hard for it now pk the strength coach uh, was a big part of this as well correct yes um as you know um i uh i think pk's circuit circuit training which was a form of initiation in a way was a great contributor to this team team dynamic of, of toughness and um taking responsibility and holding yourself and your teammates accountable for a common goal Mm -hmm. yeah right very, um, very tough experiences with his circuits but character building nonetheless yeah now later on in your career you go on to be one of the fastest 50 freestylers in the world but in 2004 you actually win the bronze medal in the in the 200 im how was that uh experience in in athens well the build up, it's a build up to the athens you know um i came in uh, as a freshman and i won the ncaa's in the im and i broke the record and a lot of people, you know, didn't take me seriously as a freshman. And um, that was good for my confidence. Then at the 2003 World Championships, I, uh, I tried to win the race in the beginning against Phelps and Thorpe. And I went out way too fast and was unable to finish as fast as I usually do. Uh, my fly is never my, was never my strong point. It was actually my weakest stroke. And to work too hard in the fly would to be um, take some of my power out of the back end. And then I went to the Pan Am Games and I corrected this mistake. And then at the end of the year, um, I had been like 159 was, I think it was the fastest in the world. So coming into 2004, I had a lot of pressure on me as the defending champion as, um, and as an international IM or in the long course pool. And the whole year was a um, very intensely focused year for me. Um, at the NCAAs, um, we really prepared well and we just absolutely dominated everything all the time. And we had the highest scoring total ever. Um, Fred broke a world record. I broke the world record in the IM. Um, and also in the sprints, I started to show that I could even come down and um, 
was versatile enough to be on all the sprint relay relays and be in the finals and on the podium in the sprint events as well. And that led into the buildup of the 2004 Olympics where I was just coming in, coming in hot. You know, I felt strong, I felt great. I felt ready for anything. And um, I did have an experience where after my um, very intensely focused buildup to the NCAAs, the Olympics sort of seemed less important in the whole team dynamic. And I wasn't an American, I didn't feel that I was um, a big priority and I, I got one of my um, age group my coaches from Trinidad to work with me and we did a lot of the build up the final build up to um, Athens training in Trinidad which was where I sustained an injury 12 days before the Olympics just before we left um, there was two things it was a spear fishing loading a very powerful uh, spear gun kind of strained my shoulder hmm. then that really was made a lot worse because I lived up on top of a mountain in the in the rainforest really and to get up to that where we lived it was a very steep winding road and i used to drive a land rover from 1964 you know one of those old time mm. defenders mm. huge wheel and i used to muscle the wheel and i strained my shoulder and i couldn't do any freestyle in the build up to the 04 Olymp olympics and um, my first races were the 200 freestyle and having been the pan am champion the year before i couldn't repeat the performance and i uh, washed out in the semifinals and was unable to produce a best time despite what felt like working 150 percent harder you know i my body was not as strong as it had been so i knew my mind i had to really um steal my mind then in the 100 freestyle, I was in the semifinals again, but unable to progress to the finals. And my injury was just really hurting my confidence. And then we came into the IM and I knew I had the fight of my life ahead of me. And it's funny how um, as you kind of um, progress in this, the big days, instead of coming on your best days, they come on your worst days. Mm. Like playing the game on level expert. And it has to be that way. Otherwise, you won't continue to grow. It will just get too easy. And in the heats, I cruised the heats. In the semifinals, my coach, Anil Roberts, um, had a brilliant strategy. We had to, we knew we had to beat Laszlo Che. And I was next to him in the semifinal. And our plan was to swim with him all the way and then purposely slow down at the end and give him a false sense of um, dominating me and beating me. And I did that. I remember at 175, just literally slowing down and looking across the pool to make sure I would come second. Oh, wow. And then in the finals, this was my seventh race of the Olympics in a very few, I don't know, three or four days. Mm. My body was exhausted. My shoulder was getting worse. My freestyle was weaker than it had ever was than it was usually. My freestyle was like my strongest stroke in the IM. And I knew I had the fight of my life ahead of me. And um, a good friend of mine from the Bahamas, Jeremy Knowles, in the ready room, he came and met me before the ready room and he brought a marker and he drew on my bicep um, a Thor's hammer with lightning bolts. Mm. My nickname in the Auburn team was the Hammer of Justice. Mm. And the hammer of justice had to do with when you're racing someone in a set or a long distance event or a difficult set and you're exhausted and they're exhausted, but you know that they're exhausted too. And you speed up to a level that is just unsustainable just as to make them give up. And then you keep speeding up and keep speeding up knowing that you can't swim more than maybe a 25 or a maximum of 50 more at this pace. And then eventually they start to think, oh man, George is very fresh over there. You know, he's just speeding up and I'm getting more tired. I'm just going to give up. And then when they give up and drop back, then you've opened up this window and then you can slow down the pace. And that was called dropping the hammer of justice on somebody. <laughs> so they would call me the hammer of justice. It was on like the championship posters and everything. And when I was feeling pretty weak, pretty down, uh, Jeremy came and drew that on my bicep and reminded me who I was and it really fired me up. And, um, and in the race, um, you know, every challenge, Brett, every challenge 
the real test in the challenge is the moment of weakness. Every challenge comes with the moment of weakness. And in the moment of weakness is the perfect excuse. It's perfect. It is a reason. And you would be okay with yourself if you accept that excuse that seems like a reason. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the backstroke, I felt weaker than I usually felt. I felt more out of breath than I usually felt at that point in time. And I had the perfect excuse to slow down. It was the injury. It was the exhaustion. I, had, I would have been okay with myself if I accepted that excuse. Yeah. And by the grace of God, you know, I was able to hold my mind strong and push through that. And um, there was a, maybe a 50 or 20 meters there where, where I was really tempted with taking that excuse. And I resisted the temptation. And then when that passed, my, my inner strength started to come back to me and I was able to push through and um, had the fastest breaststroke split. I think only Kitajima had a faster third 50 breaststroke. And I was able to come home. And, um, and Laszlo was next to me. And having seen me just drop back in the, in the semifinals, mm. and not me not dropping back, he started to wonder what's wrong. Why isn't George dropping back? And I think he started to rush his strokes and uh, put a lot of pressure on him. And then something very interesting happened. We touched the wall and there was um, Phelps celebrating and I was confused and I was looking at the scoreboard. And then later on, Lochte and everyone started celebrating and my mother has on video camera of the scoreboard, the scoreboard switching Phelps, switching Lochte and my position. So. Oh, so it, it, it was a mistake on the scoreboard. Maybe many people say that, you know, TV ratings are involved and it looks really good for American soft power being projected into the world to have a one two. So we don't know. We never know these things. Um, but the 200 IM is a real hard race. So the first part of my career was all about the 200 IM and a knee injury forced me to change. This was a, this was a, actually a story that I wanted to talk about just briefly, but you had an incident, I, I believe, where mm -hmm. at Auburn they were doing some recruiting and uh, like a recruiting trip and you guys all went out to play paintball and it was a, it was a paintball injury with your knee. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I, um, I really damaged my knee and I tore a ligament in it and completely separated the bones. I tore my PCL completely. And that was the end of my career in IM. What's interesting about that is, you know, every legend in every culture, they share many similar themes. And one of the common themes that always keeps reoccurring is that pride always comes before the fall. So my shoulder healed, I returned to college swimming and I felt invincible, Brett. I started to win with too much style. I started to tell my friends when I would break people that I was racing against. And because I was winning with too much, too much style, I had too much pride. I felt invincible. Mm. It's the way life works is the pride calls down on us the suffering that comes to humble us. And I have a good friend who used to be number one in the world in, um, in tennis. And we share a similar interest in the traditional Amazonian medicine. And he was telling me that the same thing happened to him when he was absolutely invincible and on top of his game. He suffered a knee injury and then everyone learned they could hit to his forearm and he couldn't get there and turn around to come back as fast. And he said that looking back, it was really good because it, um, it would have been too easy for him. Getting the injury was like starting to play the game on level expert. And it forced him to keep growing because you had to have so much more control over yourself to compensate for these handicaps that you're dealing with. So yeah, the 200 IM was over for me. And, um, and I really liked the 200 IM. Personally, I thought it was um, the best all round swimmer. And if we think of what the 200 IM is, you're trying to hold an unsustainable rhythm. And it's just, you can't hold it for very long. And you're trying to, while showing mastery of all four strokes and these different turns. And you're doing this in an element that if you get too tired, and if you're doing the 200 IM right, you have nothing left after 150. And you're in this element that will drown you if you get too tired. That's what the 200 IM is. It's really, really a difficult race. And I thought, well, if I'm going to keep swimming, what is the, the next race that I think is really special? And I thought it's the 50 freestyle. It's who's the fastest. 
So uh, I started um, really from nowhere and started to progress towards that goal. And I had to take a lot of beat, a lot of licks for a long time, a lot of defeat for a long time. And this journey really taught me how to win without pride. And it taught me how to lose without being defeated. Well, you I mean, you're a fascinating. This is what I mean. You're a fascinating man, George. I mean, you have an incredible story, but you also have an incredible perspective on life that uh, most people never get to this uh, level of realization of things in their life. They, they don't come to this understanding that you've come to and you are very much a deep thinker. And uh, but in terms of being able to get the best out of yourself, it's quite remarkable that you can go from uh, a world class if not the best in the world, 200 I am to a world-class 50 freestyle. It just, it's really unheard of in our sport. Uh, they're really, they're really two different sports. I mean, an, an I am and, and a 50 freestyle are completely different things. And it's, it's not something that even the great Michael Phelps could do. Um, so how did you then, uh, you, you mentioned you took some licks, but you obviously, um, studied this very hard too to, to figure out how to become this speed freestyler right i think it was a continuation of the process of just learning then practicing it and then constantly t- being tested on it mm. um, I, you know i was thinking of letting go of swimming you know i realized i could never have, be as good as i was and when you have that realization it's like well why do you really want to continue if you can't be as good as you have been and I had, to re- I had to fall in love with swimming again and learn to love it and learn to love the sweet struggle. And I went and learned, to, um, well, I had took two years of swimming in university with injuries. The first year, my, these are my second two years, just trying to do the freestyle events. And the first year I'm swimming with basically one leg, doing short course events, pushing off the wall and diving with one leg because my knee was still swollen. Mm. Then I did so much pulling in practice all the time, every single day, that I got some overuse injuries in my shoulder. Mm-hmm. And the following year, I had a shoulder injury. So life was really humbling me for my transgression of becoming too proud and feeling invincible. Mm-hmm. And then I went to learn um, from Mike Bottom. I thought that um, this is a man who's produced consistently great sprinters, Gary Hall, um, Anthony Irvin, mm-hmm. and I thought, well, all right, if I'm going to learn, let's go learn from the best. And I really devoted um, a lot of time on technique and technique. And another thing was to master this ability to bring 100% commitment to the race. Whereas in a 200 IM or a 200 free, you can dive in and then get tough later on. But the swimming in the sprints requires one to have a, um, a lot of control over their state of arousal. So you can be pumped up enough to go out there and fight while still being composed enough to hold your breath and execute all of the details perfectly, like throwing 25 bullseyes in a row. The details, the details is where the mastery lies. Nice. I like it. Uh, well, let's talk about uh, sprint freestyle and then your career in sprint freestyle, but there are many other aspects I want to get to. So, so let's kind of, Let's talk about it a little bit. You you do learn from Mike Bottom and, and you swim and, and race for him. And then why did you come to swim with me? What was the decision to, to come back to Auburn and, and swim with us? You know, I, I had left Auburn. I just, it was difficult for me those two years of swimming for the university team, trying to keep up that perfect record with these injuries. And I felt that to continue to grow, I needed to get my swimming refreshed so I left and I came back to Auburn to uh, to finish my degree and then um, Auburn had this wonderful program I'm very grateful to this man unfortunately he's no longer with us Virgil Starks mm-hmm. that um, allowed me to benefit from something called operation follow-through mm, I did the same thing yeah so we came back and I finished my degree and um, it was good to get that out of the way and while I was working on on my academics it turns out that you know some of the greatest swimmers in sprint freestyle are training with you and Richard Quick. So I decided to get back in the pool and, um, and to give this another go. And I'm very grateful that you took me in and included in me and included me in such a wonderful environment. Well, what did you learn from that group specifically? You were swimming then at that stage with Cesar Cielo, Fred Busquet, Matt Target, 
uh, Yakabanka. I mean, some a lot of great sprinters in that group. Uh, in terms of just your experience there then, um, what was the training environment like? I get that question a lot, but I can answer from my perspective. But from your perspective, what was it like then? I think, um, of course, these uh, guys like Fred and Caesar, they were the best in the world at the time. And me just coming up into sprint freestyle, I saw it as an incredible opportunity to constantly be testing myself against the best and constantly be refining. What am I doing? Is this working? Is that working? How's my dive? How am I, how's my technique? How's my turns? Am I getting stronger than them in the gym? Am I diving better? And I think you created an environment that allowed us to, to feed off our, our innate competitiveness. And there was a synergy where we did a lot of race pace, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. You had a philosophy where we started off swimming fast and we tried to swim fast for longer. That was different. That was, um, I think that's the way to do it. Um, in that environment, I was really thriving as, a, as an athlete. Yeah. Just moving off of the environment and constantly testing myself against guys who had been better than me. Was Caesar a difficult uh, training partner? Difficult. Um, if I remember correctly, there were there were examples where you know I'm coming from background of really hard work, 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 work. It's the consistency that matters. And um, some of the high end sprinters, I realized, you know, when it's when they feel good, that's when they go fast. If they're not feeling good, they kind of hold back and let their body recover. Mm -hmm. That was something uh, I'd seen Dewey do before, and. Um, it was a good lesson to see, you know, Caesar and Fred operate like this as well. And then eventually I learned that later on. So you uh, end up becoming uh, one of the world's fastest sprinters over a, a number of years um, in different environments. And, and then was it in 2012 that you had your first real success by making the Olympic final in, in the 50 freestyle? Or had you felt like you'd had some success before that in that event? Um, well, I had success in 2009 being in the finals, 2011 being in the finals again. And then in 2011, I, I suffered a brain injury that had me laid up in bed for six weeks and I lost you know, all my fitness and all my strength. What and happened? A dump truck crashed into me. We crashed into each other and really oh, wow. um, destroyed the car. And just by, I can't even claim it, just my organism's innate reflexes, I kind of pulled up into the fetal position in the middle when the driver's side got smashed and my head hit the dashboard very hard and um, I had a subdural hematoma on my brain for a while. Mm. I ran the risk that if my blood pressure got high, uh, I would have ha could have had a stroke. So it was a very difficult and stressful time for me and a, a complete reset in many ways. Where did this crash happen? Um, in Trinidad, I was going to go um, spearfishing early, early in the morning. Oh. And I was on my way to this very remote part of Trinidad. And um, that's where it happened. Wow, you were lucky that uh, you were able to get pulled out of there. And, and you, I imagine you would just rush straight to a hospital, huh? I kind of um, was on the side of the road for a while. And I had this interesting experience where I woke up into already being awake. It's like my consciousness returned to me outside of the car with my pockets full of garbage and just standing out there. And I remembered I had been in China, but I didn't remember coming back. And I thought, where am I? Am I in China? What am I doing? Who am I? Where am I? Did you think you were dead? I couldn't really think properly. My mind was just a mess at that time. Wow. Brain injury, you know? Mm. Wow. Mm. Well, it's very scary. But, um, well, then you ultimately have, uh, I remember from 2013, watching you at the World Championships and going to compete for a medal in the 50 freestyle and actually getting the bronze medal. This, this was, to me, um, a culmination of all this incredible hard work and, and, and um, you know, obviously all these injuries that you've gone through. But finally... Uh, I got to see from a distance George Bavel at his uh, supreme best, you know, uh, with Mike Bottom, with the person that I think coached you the best, that understood you the best, that got the best out of you. 
Uh, I, I, like I said, I watched you from a distance at that championships and I could tell there was something different going on with you there and you were ready to perform and you did, you end up getting the bronze medal in the 50 freestyle at the world championships. Yeah. in a 21 51, but I think that was a culmination of, um, constantly sharpening my skills during the world cup. I had this rivalry with Anthony Irvin. And we were swimming very fast, many swims below 21 short course meters. And, um, you know, I'm always learning from my mistakes and that really helped me. And um, coming into 2013, I think my technique was the best it had ever been. I was mm -hmm. the strongest I had ever been. And um, funnily enough, um, the heats of the 50 freestyle was my first 50 freestyle of the year. Semifinals was my second and the final was my third. Wow. <laughs> I was like 15th after the heats um eighth or yes eighth after the semis so um, wow did you know in the final that that things were clicking for you that that you were doing something special in the final yes um i was learning to pace the 50 if you can believe it talk to me about that what do you mean i think um you know, coming from an IM and more of a distance background, I don't think I was naturally as speedy as some of these other people. I had to work to be fast. I had to put mm -hmm. a lot of power into it. Mm -hmm. And if we think of the 50 freestyle in terms of like a graph, the best 50 freestyle would be the most area underneath the curve. Now, if you're going to swim your 50 freestyle where you're in top speed at 25 and then a rapid drop off, you have less area under the curve as if you have a nice, smooth, long arc. You might not be as fast as the fastest point, but you're going faster for a much longer period of time. And I was starting to swim the 50 freestyle like that. We're actually like in the beginning holding back and um, riding about 95% um, and just using my dive. To, it's like jumping on a bicycle that's already going downhill. Mm -hmm and really gradually applying the power to sort of build through 35 into 40 meters and then sustain it and stop it from falling apart in the last 10. Oh, well, very, very good explanation. I like that. Something a little bit different, but people, people want to hear different things. And I think that's a good one. So, uh, well, a fantastic result and um, kind of almost towards the end of a, an incredible career, um, so that, that's kind of the swimming side of you that I, I certainly wanted to touch on. And I think that's great for everybody to understand who you were and where you came from. But there are, there's a whole new layer to you now that I'm really interested in as well. Um, you've done some things after swimming that have shaped your life and I think could also uh, be great to share with, with everybody. So where do, you want, where do you want to start this story? Talk to me about some of the things you've done since you've retired from swimming. Well, I have to, we have, the story begins at the end of the last uh, story. Yep. The end is the beginning. Towards the end of my swimming career, I started to realize that, um, that the Olympics and international sport is really the a big circus. It's, the Olympics is their first reality TV show. Mm -hmm. If it started today, of course, we'd say it's a reality TV show. But because we've been born into it, we don't really question it or see it objectively. And I was getting into sports politics because I thought, you know, the next progression is to get into the IOC. And I was a delegate for Trinidad for the Pan American Sports Organization, where the head of FINA was the head of that organization. And I started to, after talking to him, I realized just the type of people who go into these organizations. And I started to understand their priorities. And they wanted to be as sensational as possible. They want the maximum amount of media attention. Because the more media attention, the more the circus is worth and the more they can sell it for. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to catch the people who are cheating. They want to make it sensational. They want to give the appearance that they care about it. But at this point in time, the McLaren report was coming out and all these doping scandals were being leaked. And I felt so disillusioned by it. Mm -hmm. And for a while, I thought of it as, oh, my gosh, I have just been wasting my time in this gladiatorial arena. Like, what is this for? Like, this is all in a big show, a big circus. I, was, I, I thought I was this illusion, this media term called a swimmer. Mm -hmm. The person who was practicing swimming. So if you think you're a swimmer, it's an illusion. You're a person who competes and practices in swimming as a way to grow as a person. And this illusion started to melt down for me. 
And there's a quote I love. It says that uh, waking up is a very destructive process. It's the melting away of illusions. And I went into the Rio Olympics and compared to the previous Olympics, it was very poorly managed and organized and the facilities were poor, the food was poor. And I realized that it, you know, I was very, I was just over it. It, it was time for me to move on. Yeah. And I realized that you don't get old so much as swimming gets old. And I, I look back upon my career now as my mental and physical slavery years. All my medals are just trinkets. And I realized that what I actually got out of it is worth so much more than any medal. I got a level of self-awareness and self-control that I simply would not have been able to get in any other way. If I had a mediocre life as a regular person, I would never have gone into those very extreme experiences that tested me and forced me to keep growing and growing so that on a difficult day, when, every, when I'm exhausted, I can bring out the best in myself. Or if everything is stressful, I have enough self-awareness and self-control that I can be calm. In a dangerous environment, I can be playful. And when I'm dealing with a very angry or ignorant person, instead of myself becoming as a natural reaction to the situation, angry or ignorant, I can respond like consciously and intentionally and be calm and relaxed and thoughtful and peaceful and calm them down, and then they'll be able to actually listen to me. So this, this path of going through these very extreme experiences and pushing my organism to its physical limits every single day allowed my willpower to keep growing and my self-awareness to keep growing because what is a great performance in sport? It's a strong mind that's able to push the organism way outside of its safety comfort zone. Yes. With organisms, bio-robots, horse is programmed by nature to want to stay inside of its comfort zone mm -hmm. so very often you know all of the athletes we train our organisms we make our organisms stronger and faster but very few athletes actually train the mind so the organism is like your horse and the mind is like your rider mm -hmm. so what good is it if you're only training your horse you have to train your rider you don't take a 12 million dollar horse in dubai and put a weekend rider on it correct you know, yeah it'd be great you have to train both and the result that you get out of training both is a level of self-awareness and self-control that carries over into the greater context of life into everything that you do you can be so much more present and aware and have so much more self-control to make decisions that very often are all about short-term pain for long-term gain and that's was the reward for my swimming. I've given away a lot of my top medals. I haven't even seen my Olympic medals since 04. I don't even care about the medals. The reward was this level of self-mastery. And I, I mentor some athletes from different sports and I help them to see that you're not an athlete. You're someone who's practicing sport as a path to self-mastery. And that the reward will be the rest of your life. Wow, George. And uh, I'm unworthy uh, for what the, the speech you just gave us. It's, it, it belongs on a bigger platform, my friend. Uh, the level of self-awareness is incredible. So that, that path, I realized that it's all about, you know, learning, practicing, and challenging yourself. And then in swimming and in life, every challenge comes with a moment of weakness. That's the test. And if you can push through the moment of weakness... It doesn't matter if you're a cancer patient fighting stage four lymphoma or uh, an immigrant trying to make ends meet to pay bills to keep food on the table and shelter above your family or an athlete in the Olympic finals with an injury. As long as you can have the inner strength to resist that temptation to take the easy way out. In the moment of weakness and push through it, I consider you to be a champion. You're only really competing against yourself. And a lot of athletes out there, you know, we compete, we think we're competing, but the competing, this idea of competing is a very low, it's a perspective that is a very low perspective, low level of consciousness. It's very fair based. And very often it is the athletes who need to win the most who deep down inside feel like the biggest losers. And there are many gold medalists out there who still feel like big losers. 
because maybe they were raised in a way where love was conditional for them. They only received love from their parents if they did this or did that. And deep down, they're trying to prove to themselves and to everybody else that they're worthy of love. And if you realize, hey, I'm only, a per I'm only human. I'm perfectly imperfect. I have limits. I'm weak at times. When you are secure with yourself, and you have nothing to prove to anybody anymore, then you can transcend this level of sport that is done based on competing. Just begin to do it in a way that's instead of fear-based, fear of not being judged worthy, to do it in a way that's based on love, where you're no longer competing, but you're practicing an art form. And an art form, it can be very aggressive. It can be very intense and fiery, aggressive, fast, 50 freestyle. It can be an art form. And that way you are no longer competing and you cannot be beaten. There's nothing to prove. It's only for the enjoyment of the experience and the growth that you will gain by testing yourself and pushing yourself beyond your limits. Now you did go to some some far out places to to study um, these principles and these philosophies. Talk to me about some of the places you've been and and some of the people that you've uh, interacted with. So um, immediately after the Olympics, I began to start a business of importing orthopedic braces, and I got the agency from this German brand for the whole Caribbean, and um, I became an instructor of free diving. That's uh, where you're diving really deep and holding your breath. And that's like becoming an underwater stuntman. That was challenging me in a whole bunch of new ways, getting more control and more self-awareness of my organism. So it was a continuation of my swimming path, that growth. And then I realized that the idea of starting this business wasn't really my idea. It was just a cultural program, mm -hmm. brainwashing, conditioning that I was expressing based on seeking security, but it was not what I wanted to do. It really wasn't what I wanted to do. It was just what was expected. Sure. And I gave away my business to my, my partner and I decided to make a list of all the things that the hero of my story would do, all the things that I wanted to learn and practice and then master and then eventually teach. So I went around one by one down this list, pursuing these, um, these passions and that took me to where I am today, really. I'm free diving instructor. Then I got into hypnosis and NLP, and then I became a permaculture designer. Then I ended up, um, and I continue to go every year and spend a few months with my teacher in South India where I'm um, learning Ayurveda in the traditional uh, guru cool system. Then I'm also interested in another type of medicine, which is the traditional Amazonian medicine, and I have a teacher there as well. And... Um, what allows me to do this is um, I, um, I got into cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin, mm -hmm. and blockchain, digital assets. And that's a whole nother journey of self-mastery. You know, you got to take the time to learn. And then it's about getting control over your emotions. Because when the entire market is feeling euphoria, you are feeling the euphoria. When they're feeling the greed, you are feeling the greed too. Mm have to have the level of self-awareness to understand that if you're feeling it in your unconscious organism the market is feeling it the market's like a bipolar eighth grader and you have to have the self-awareness to master your greed the greed is always punished and to master your fear because some of the best opportunities are when there is the most fear so in terms of the the medicine itself what does that mean to to study the medicine so ayurveda Unfortunately, I was only exposed to it after I had retired after the Rio Olympics. Mm -hmm. Ayurveda means in Sanskrit, life knowledge. And it's this incredible body of wisdom coming down from thousands of years ago. Um, the roots of it are in very enlightened yogis who paid a lot of attention to their organism and how to, to optimize it, how to live in a way that is going to ensure the greatest longevity and maximum vitality in our organism mm -hmm. it's a way of understanding nature and when we understand nature we no longer work against nature we work with nature to restore balance and harmony and the root of all disease is a type of imbalance so by keeping everything balanced um, we can ensure health and initially when i was going to study this um, it was my olympic past that unlocked this for me because the teacher Dr. Harry, he said, um, he, 
this is a serious person. This is someone who can follow through with things. So he took me as an apprentice. And one of the first things he told me was, I don't give certificates. And, um, you know, in the West, we need a certificate to prove that we know our stuff. Yeah. Show everybody, look, I know my stuff. I've got a certificate. And um, in the West, we learn in a way that's based on memorizing. So I went to learn in the way that this knowledge was passed down, um, which is all about understanding and learning to see and recognize patterns. And I lived with a family in South India on three, three different trips for many months at a time, um, learning. And then eventually when I understood sitting in the office with, the, with my teacher when he is um, having patients come in and learning to read the signs. And in the same way, your car has a dashboard that shows how much gas you have, mm. how, um, how's your battery level, what's your temperature. We have all of these signs on our face and our hands and our body, and we can learn to read them and learn to like restore balance, just tip the scales before there's any negative consequences. And that's amazing. And if I had known that, oh, I would have been so much more healthy during my swimming career. I'd have performed consistently better. And the people who practice this usually live very long. And if we think of a lion, a lion is an animal that doesn't have any predators. It usually dies of old age. And a lion in its old age, still strong enough, fast enough, and has good enough eyesight to hunt and kill up until the weekend it dies. When we see old people today, we see the results of people who have punished and poisoned their organisms for decades. And Brett, they are walking corpses. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be that way. We learn to, to take care of our organism and keep it in harmony with nature and its own nature. Then we will live very long and thrive well into our old age. Well, a that, lot of people doing that aren't even old these days. They're in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. Yeah, and um, it's so I think this is due to the, what we're enjoying because of the internet, sort of a second renaissance where a lot of this ancient, powerful wisdom time tested over thousands of years is now coming out again. And that's also how I'm also interested in uh, traditional Amazonian medicine. Richard, these things are very useful and they have concepts that are very powerful and would benefit um, a lot of people out there, especially in sport today. What's your uh, end game in this? Uh, are you just looking for wisdom? Are you looking for a better life? Are you, uh, how are you, I mean, what's your end game here? You know, when you realize how good this stuff is and how immediately applicable it is to your quality of life and to the quality of lives, quality of life of your loved ones, you realize, man, why am I want to watch TV? Why do I want to be entertained when I can learn something that is so good to know? Mm. And the health is real wealth. You know, very often you see someone who's got this big house mansion but their body is just diseased and decrepit and they're suffering. You don't really live in your house as much as you live in your body. When you see this old guy and he's got this Porsche, but he can't go up the stairs properly without bending over and huffing and puffing. He's so sick and out of shape and unhealthy. Like take care of your organism, you know? George, it sounds like you're on, on a path to become a guru, to be, to be honest. I don't know where it ends, but it's, uh, it's about an upward spiral. As you get more healthy, Brett, you think in more healthy ways. When you think in more healthy ways, you actually want what is good for you. And you wholeheartedly don't want what is bad for you. Mm -hmm. Anything like Amazon Medicine will talk about this. Anything in nature that is really healthy is really strong. Like a healthy gazelle can eat grass right in front of the lion. And because it's health healthy, it's strong. It exudes confidence because it feels safe with itself. It trusts itself. And the lion can sense that. And the lion knows not even to think of trying to attack that gazelle because it'll never get it. And when you get more healthy and you think in more healthy ways, you have more willpower to resist temptations. And because you're thinking in more healthy ways, your self-awareness and self-control keep growing. And then the opposite is also true. Anything that is in sick in nature is weak it's the sick animals that are weak and because they're weak they know they're weak inside they are afraid and the fear that they are exuding is like dinner bells for the predators 
It says, eat me. I'm not sure of myself. I'm weak. I'm afraid. And the fear is like a sickness of the spirit. It's a, it's a symptom of the weakness. Now, when you get sick, you think in unhealthy ways and you want what's bad for you, which makes you even more sick. So you think in even more unhealthy ways and you want more of what's bad for you. And this is like, you know, when people get addicted to things, mm. they get so sick, they don't even understand that they're getting sicker and they lack the willpower to stop consuming the poison. They think, oh, I can quit any time. Oh, I'm fine. But the further down you go in this downward spiral of sickness, the less self-awareness you have. So you don't even understand that you're sick and you don't have the willpower to stop. So it's a downward spiral that really ends in total decay and death. It's essentially death energy, defeat energy. And health and strength is victory energy. It's life energy in its purest form. So if you want to be a great athlete, you need to be as healthy as possible in body, mind, and spirit. So it's not only a healthy organism, but a healthy mind with very strong willpower to be able to push your organism further and further outside of its comfort zone. But when you're sick, you're weak. You lack the willpower. You're taking the easy way out. You're always going for short-term gain, long-term pain, and which makes you even sicker and weaker. And your self-awareness and self-control is getting reduced and reduced. So you're spiraling down if you're sick and you're spiraling up if you're getting healthy. And once I understood this, I looked at my whole life and I, I went through it and I realized all the things that were medicinal in my life and all the things that were poisonous. And when I could see that and I could I was healthy enough to actually wholeheartedly want what's good for me and not want what's bad for me, I was able to choose to get more of the things that I would call medicinal and cut out the things that were poisonous. Now get this, these are things like, not only is it the food we consume, it's the place we live. That can be environmental medicine or poison. It's the relationships we have. It's the media we consume. It's the state of arousal of our nervous system. When your organism is stressed, it's prioritizing short-term survival because it's, it's designed to live in a more primitive, wild environment. It doesn't understand this modern environment. When your organism is getting stressed, prioritizing survival, you are stopping the body's natural processes that clean and heal and repair and delete bad copies of itself. Prioritize watching out for danger and being ready. When you can take control of your nervous system and relax your nervous system, and keep it balanced and calm, then nature's own intelligence will kick in and your body will clean and heal and repair and delete bad copies of itself. And then you need much less sleep at night and you will age much more slowly, which is why high pressure jobs, people who have those jobs might make a lot of money, but they don't live very long and they're not very healthy. So your state of arousal can be medicine or poison. Wow. And then, the way that you speak to yourself, mm. words, the words you use in your mind can be medicinal or poisonous. Mm. The word, Brad, is not just a piece of language, brother. It's a package of energy, of emotion. And when we're sick, we tend to give ourselves poisonous words in our mind that make us even weaker. And we say things like, oh, I can't do this. I can't do that. I'm not good enough. I'm not ready. I'm tired. When we're strong, we speak to ourselves in like Conor McGregor language. I'm the greatest. I'm going to do it. I guarantee success. I will make it happen. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. But in sport, very often in the moment of weakness, in the challenge, when we need to be feeding ourselves medicinal words, we're doing the opposite. We're telling ourselves, oh, I'm tired. Oh, it's the 150 oh my gosh, it hurts so much. And if we want to be truly great, when we are feeling our weakest is when we need to be giving ourselves emotional medicine, powerful phrases that empower us and strengthen our spirit. And that's another element of performance that is all about training the rider of the horse because we mostly just train the horse itself. Mm -hmm. And the stakes are high because every time you meet a challenge and you make the challenge, you get more willpower and more strength and more confidence. So the next challenge is even easier. And if you give up on the challenge, 
it's even easier to give up on the next challenge because you lose strength and confidence and willpower. So the stakes are high. When you understand the stakes are high, and you can chart the course all the way up the mountain. George, it's fascinating stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm like riveted just like listening to, to this. And uh, one of the questions that came up in my mind is, how could I start this process like, of, of a journey that you're on? Where, where would I start if I wanted to learn more? Hmm. Where would I start? Um, I would start with um, understanding what Ayurveda is. Mm -hmm. Ayurveda is an amazing body of wisdom. Mm -hmm. um, I would understand also that my organism is constantly reacting to its environment. Have you ever seen the movie, My Octopus Teacher? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, yeah. So you know when the octopus is in the kelp, mm -hmm. it's looking like the kelp. When it's in the sand, it's looking like the sand. Mm. When it's on the rock, it's looking like the rock. Yeah. Now this bio robot, its nervous system is just like the octopus. It's constantly reacting to its environment to run this algorithm that's determining is our environment threatening. And if the environment is determined to be threatening, we're transforming into a version of ourselves that's more able to meet that threat. Our nervous system is moving towards the sympathetic fight or flight. Mm respond to things from fear or aggression. And if our organism subconscious intelligence, subconscious has calculated that this environment is peaceful and calm, there's enough, I'm not lacking anything, then the nervous system will adapt to the environment by moving the nervous system towards the rest and digest level, which is the parasympathetic. And in this state, we more feel love and gratitude and playfulness. Now, our nervous system is always reacting to its environment. Our organism is our horse, our bio robot. Now, the first way to, do, to get control of it is you have to become aware of it because anything that's outside of our awareness is outside of our control. Mm -hmm. So you need to practice checking in with your organism all the time. How is my breathing? Oh, my breathing might be shallow. Breathe properly because if the breath is wandering, the mind is wandering. If you want to feel your breath, you have to feel your best. You have to breathe your best. So by breathing the organism, I'm sending a very powerful signal to my nervous system. That everything is okay. What's my body language like? Is my body language tense, small? Open it. This sends a very powerful signal to your nervous system. That everything is okay. What are the facial muscles doing? Are you frowning? You have so many nerves in your face. If you're even frowning a little, you're sending a very powerful message to your nervous system that everything is not okay. Danger, survival mode, watch out. Because this is a dumb organism. It's designed for survival hundreds of thousands of years ago in wild African savanna. It doesn't understand modern environment, the devices and TV and coffee. And these things are constantly stress it. And then check what your tongue is doing. Is your tongue pressing on the roof of your mouth? And when you start to consciously go through your physiology and relax your physiology, you're affecting your nervous system and your nervous system is affecting your brain chemistry and your brain chemistry is affecting your quality of thoughts. So in this way, you can take control of your organism by cultivating this level of self-awareness. And the beautiful thing is when you get control over your organism, Instead of reacting to the environment, you can consciously respond to the environment to be the best version of yourself. It's like taking control of the octopus and being like, you know what? I don't want to look like the kelp when I'm in the kelp. I want to make and be this cool form that is not threatening. Or I want to enjoy what I can do with my eight limbs instead of having this subconscious intelligence always taking over. Now, the beautiful thing is that when we get control over ourselves, instead of reacting to the environment, the environment can react to us. So your friends, your relationships, your partners, if they are very stressed and they make you stressed, you're gonna make them even more stressed and they'll make you even more stressed. And yeah. both of your nervous systems will be moving into fight or flight. Yeah. You'll be responding to each other from fear and aggression. But if you can get control of yourself and you keep yourself very relaxed, very calm, you communicate in the language of the nervous system, which is body language, breathing, 
hydrate. You can actually have your environment start to react to you by taking conscious control over yourself. So when you deal with someone who's angry and aggressive and you don't get angry and aggressive, they'll actually, their organisms, in one intelligence will say, wait a minute, the environment is no longer threatening and their subconscious intelligence will transform them into a, a more suitable version of themselves for an environment that's no longer perceived to be threatening. Mm. In that way, you'll be able to communicate with people. You won't have two people who are blocked and in fight or flight mode. And that will smooth over so many relationships in your life. And this is a type of thing that we, the, the more you start to understand yourself, the more you start to understand other people and the more you can help other people. And these traditions of like Ayurveda and traditional Amazonian medicine are very holistic approaches to, to self mastery and health of body, mind and spirit. And um, I am gonna to continue to pursue them as long as I live. Um, and my two teachers are exemplary individuals, like some of the greatest people I know, the most high, the most humble, the most wise, and they're also the most powerful people I know with the greatest capacity to affect positive change around them because they're so in control of themselves instead of reacting to their environment. They can consciously make the environment react to them. And I aspire to be like that. I work hard at it every day. Well, I'll tell you, uh, you're, you're, you're getting there because um, we, had, we had a private talk yesterday uh, on, on FaceTime and I could tell there was a different glow about you. I hadn't seen you in many years. But you were you were constantly even now you're constantly smiling when you speak. You have a, a different energy, a different glow. Um, the the level of um, you know forgiveness that you gave me, and and the just the reaching out, and uh, it changed everything about the way I felt. Uh, immediately changed uh, even things within me. So you definitely had an effect, and and so I I can see it, George. It's very very powerful. Mm. There's some tools, you know, from these practices. Um, in studying in the traditional system in India, my teacher, he's also a Vedic scholar, a great scholar, and um, a yoga, a great yogi as well. Pra yogis, I tend to think of those Himalayan guys. I'd say practitioner of yoga. And I learned from him the traditional classical Hatha yoga that he learned from his guru, who learned from his guru, and it comes down from great yogis in the Himalayas. And I practice this classical Hatha yoga, and the pranayama breathing exercises. And Brett, if I had to go back and be a swimmer, I would incorporate half of my training as pranayama. Mm. It is the ultimate biohacking and it is enlightened exercise. The amount of healthy benefits it has for your body, mind, and spirit. It's like medicine that makes you stronger. So I do it a lot, even though it's very difficult and miserable. Well, I have a couple of athletes that I'm working with now that I'll certainly be taking this to. And, and first of all, they'll be listening to this podcast and then uh, highly recommending that they move into that area to study that and, and learn that. So stuff that's now coming out again, you know, we're mm. in a sort of second renaissance. Yeah. Well, listen, man, this has been incredible, uh, very fascinating. And I, I could just sit there and listen all day. You're, you're so insightful. So I appreciate your time. Um, I hope uh, everybody listens to this all the way to the end. I'll be recommending they do that because there's so much to learn here. But it's just nice to see you, George. It's nice to see you very healthy, very happy. And uh, I appreciate your time greatly. Thank you, Brett. Thank you. Um, I'm very honored to be on your podcast and I'm a big fan. Thank you, my friend. All right. We'll take care and we'll definitely stay in touch from now on. Okay. We can catch up in person sometime. Absolutely. I love that. All right. Take care, George. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.